El Cid has been immortalized in story and song, but he was a true historical man whose life is even more fascinating than the legend. Rodrigo Diaz, long before he earned the title of the Cid, which comes from an Arabic word meaning Lord, was born around 1043 in a tiny village called Vivar, north of Burgos. He was literate and was trained in his youth to be a skilled horseman and warrior. He grew up during the reign of King Fernando I of Leon Castile, a great conqueror who we discuss at length in a previous video. Rodrigo came from a well-positioned knightly family, and he grew up alongside King Fernando's eldest son, Sancho, to whom he was devoted. When Sancho himself became king, he rewarded his faithful friend Rodrigo by making him commander of his military. Thus, during Sancho's brief reign, Rodrigo was one of the most powerful men in the kingdom. After Sancho's untimely death, Rodrigo continued on in the service of the new king, Sancho's brother, Alfonso VI of Leon Castile. Rodrigo, as a learned man, often attended to legal matters for his king. In 1075, Alfonso rewarded the Cid with a prestigious marriage to one of his own relatives, the Lady Jimena. Thus, at the close of the 1070s, Rodrigo seemed to be very much on the ascent. However, his status at Alfonso's court was about to change dramatically. Lately, Alfonso VI had serious designs on the Moorish Taif estate of Toledo. Toledo had long been a great source of tribute for the Kingdom of Leon Castile, but the region was coming under serious tumult. Factions among the Moors competed for power, and Alfonso VI had to intervene personally to ensure that his puppet, Al-Qadir, remained on the throne. However, Al-Qadir's rule was unstable, and he had little control over the many warlike Moorish bands roaming about his territory. In the early summer of 1081, a group of Moorish bandits emerged from Toledan territory, entered Castile, and raided the castle of Gormas. The Cid responded by gathering together an army, crossing into Toledan lands, and ravaging the countryside. Historians have long been puzzled by Rodrigo's actions here. Surely he must have been aware that Al-Qadir himself would have never ordered this raid, and a Castilian attack on Al-Qadir's lands was embarrassing to the king of Leon Castile, who extracted considerable tribute from Toledo in exchange for protection. At any rate, King Alfonso could not overlook this transgression, and was obliged to exile Rodrigo. Thus, the Cid departed for the east of the peninsula, where he would in time perform deeds that would render his name immortal. The Cid set out in exile in 1081, leading a small band of his own knights. These were men who fought and trained alongside Rodrigo, who forged them into a powerful fighting force. The Cid was a broad-minded man, and we learn from Ibn Bassam, a hostile Moorish source, how he valued literature. It is said that books were studied in his presence. The warlike deeds of the old heroes of Arabia were read to him, and when the story of Moalab was reached, he was seized with delight and expressed himself full of admiration for this hero. At first, the Cid traveled to Christian Catalonia, where the Count of Barcelona declined his offer of service. From there, he journeyed to Moorish Zaragoza, where he was well received by the Emir Al Mutamin. Al Mutamin felt threatened by his brother and neighbor, Al Hayib, who ruled Lerida and Tortosa, and had designs on Zaragoza itself. Thus, Al Mutamin could make good use of a distinguished warrior in exile like El Cid. In the summer of 1082, Al Hayib formed an alliance with King Sancho of Aragon and Count Berenguer Ramon of Barcelona both of whom had an interest in expanding their influence into Zaragozan territory. Bolstered by his Christian allies, al Hayeb launched an invasion into his brother's domain. Rodrigo organized a capable defense, refortifying key castles, and leading a coalition force of Christians and Moors against the invaders. The two armies clashed in battle near Tamarite, and the Cid won a remarkable victory. Rodrigo even captured the Count of Barcelona himself, a most prestigious prisoner. The Cid returned in triumph to Zaragoza, where al Mutamin gave him a hero's welcome. The Count of Barcelona, treated honorably since his capture, was then released and returned to his own lands. For another four years, the Cid would remain in al Mutamin's service. Repeatedly, he thwarted the efforts of al Hayib, the King of Aragon, and the Count of Barcelona against Zaragoza. By 1084, Rodrigo was one of the most prestigious figures at al Mutamin's court, an indispensable commander in the army. 
By serving Zaragoza, Rodrigo could still act in some way to benefit his former lord, King Alfonso VI, who had long received tribute from Zaragoza and considered himself its overlord. By thwarting the efforts of Aragon and Barcelona in the region, he protected Leonie's interests. This is an interesting feature of the Cid's exile, that he always retained a certain loyalty to King Alfonso, despite their strained relationship. Indeed, when Alfonso besieged Zaragoza in 1085, Rodrigo refused to aid Almotamin in defending the city. In 1085, Alfonso VI, King of Leon and Castile, was at the pinnacle of his power. With Toledo in his possession, his kingdom now reached into the heart of Spain and stood poised to expand farther into the Muslim-controlled portions of the peninsula, known as Al-Andalus. The emirs who ruled the Muslim city-states in southern Spain, called taifas, recognized their inability to counter Alfonso's power, and so appealed to the Almoravids of North Africa for help. So who were these Almoravids? The Almoravids were a Berber sect that maintained militaristic discipline while strictly observing the core tenets of Islam. Their leader was a stern, enigmatic figure, Yusuf ibn Tashfin. Unlike the cultured Muslim emirs of Spain who lived in luxury, Yusuf was a rugged warrior of the desert. Yusuf's personal discipline inspired great loyalty in his followers. Under him, the Almoravids conquered Morocco and western Algeria and thus dominated much of North Africa. Yusuf and his men rejected the wealth and luxury that they believed had corrupted the Muslim cities of the day and instead insisted on simple dress. They veiled themselves to the eyes as a sign that they were set apart, earning them the moniker of the Veiled Ones. Yusuf considered the Taifa emirs of Spain to be effete, ineffectual, and negligent of their obligations as Muslims. And yet, the Spanish emirs were willing to risk being conquered themselves by the Almoravids rather than see all of the Iberian Peninsula fall to the Christians. Al-Mutamid, emir of Sevilla, wrote that he would rather herd camels for the Almoravids than tend hogs for Alfonso VI. Yusuf ibn Tashfin responded favorably to the appeal from the Taifa states of Spain. He had no interest in saving the Taifa emirs, but was eager to extend his power into the Iberian Peninsula for the greater good of Islam. Gathering a tremendous army, Yusuf landed at Algeciras on July 30, 1086, roughly a year since Alfonso VI had conquered Toledo. At Sevilla, Yusuf issued a call to all of Islamic Spain to unite with him against Alfonso VI. The emirs of Sevilla and Granada responded, joining the North African army. This Muslim coalition now marched on Badajoz. Yusuf's priority was to drive the Christians from Toledo. Meanwhile, Alfonso VI was besieging Zaragoza, the northernmost of the great Muslim taifa cities. When he received news of the Almoravid invasion, Alfonso abandoned the siege and assembled his forces. He sent an appeal for help to Sancho I, King of Aragon, who sent an Aragonese contingent. Early in the autumn, the Christians marched south to counter the Almoravid advance. On October 23, 1086, the Christian and Muslim armies faced off in battle at Sagrajas, northeast of Badajoz. Alfonso's army contained roughly 2,500 men, composed of about 750 heavy cavalry, plus some 750 less experienced light cavalry and around 1,000 foot soldiers. The Muslim coalition outnumbered the Christian forces by roughly three to one, but Alfonso VI trusted in the strength of his heavy cavalry, which he believed could break the enemy formations and deliver a quick victory. Initially, the Christian forces decimated the Muslim vanguard with a series of cavalry charges. Yusuf had placed the forces of the Spanish emirs in the front while keeping his own Almoravids in reserve. Finally, Yusuf unleashed his men in a solid formation to the rhythm of war drums. The Christian cavalry, worn out from fighting all day, began to be pressed back. Alfonso now saw that Muslim troops were overrunning his camp and his entire army was in danger of being enveloped by the numerically superior enemy. Thus, King Alfonso ordered a retreat, which resulted in a fighting march into the nightfall as the Christian forces withdrew. During the battle, Alfonso was wounded in the calf, leaving a bone scar that would be found by researchers 900 years later. 
The Christian army retired to Coria, some 125 kilometers to the northeast, and then to Toledo, where Alfonso prepared the city for a possible siege. Roughly half of the Christian army was destroyed. The Almoravids decapitated the Christian dead and sent the heads in carts to the cities of Al-Andalus to announce the victory. And yet, despite this triumph, Yusuf was not able to conquer Toledo, nor any Christian territory. Alfonso VI was still in a strong position and organized a solid defense of Toledo. The Almoravids had suffered high casualties as well, and Yusuf doesn't seem to have had the numbers to contemplate an attack on Toledo. Instead, he quickly withdrew to North Africa. King Alfonso was now desperate for help against this dangerous new enemy. He formally pardoned the Cid, though their relationship remained stormy for years to come. The king authorized the Cid to hold by hereditary right any lands he might conquer from the Moors in the east. The Cid set out for the Moorish Taifa state of Valencia, which was a prime target for the Almoravids. There, Rodrigo established himself as protector of Al Qadir, Emir of Valencia, and longtime puppet of Alfonso VI. Within Valencia, however, the local Moorish nobles were disgusted with Al Qadir's obeisance to the Christians. They sent word to the Almoravids, requesting that they come and occupy the city. By now, the Almoravids controlled virtually all of the Moorish portions of Spain, called Al Andalus, including the great cities of Cordoba, Sevilla, and Granada. Meanwhile, the Moors of Valencia revolted in October of 1092. Al Qadir, the puppet emir, tried to escape disguised as a woman, but he was seized by the Moorish nobles and executed on October 28. The Cid, however, was not about to let Valencia fall unchallenged into the lap of the Almoravids. In July of 1093, he besieged and blockaded the city, trapping the rebels inside. The Moors of Valencia were now in a desperate situation, but they resisted for nearly a year. Finally, reduced to starvation, the Moors surrendered on June 15, 1094, and the Cid entered Valencia in triumph. Concerned about security, the Cid expelled part of the Moorish population from Valencia, distributing their property as booty to his troops. He replaced them with Mozarabs, Christians who'd been living under Moorish rule in the suburbs, whom he considered to be more loyal to him. Those Moors permitted to remain in Valencia were allowed to continue the practice of their faith and maintain their property so long as they paid tribute to El Cid as their lord. With his wife, Doña Jimena, and his children, the Cid took up residence in the Alcazar, Valencia's great fortress palace. We are told that the Cid climbed with his wife, two daughters, and son up to the highest tower to gaze out over the beautiful city that they now ruled. Rodrigo's achievement was astounding. In the heart of Moorish territory, against all but impossible odds, he'd won an independent principality. The question now was how long could the Cid maintain this precarious position? The fall of Valencia horrified the Moorish world almost as much as the fall of Toledo nine years prior. Yusuf ibn Tashfin, ruler of the Almoravids, dispatched his nephew Muhammad at the head of an African army, augmented by Andalusian contingents, with explicit orders to drive the Cid from Valencia. By September of 1094, the Almoravid forces advanced on Valencia. The Cid sought help from King Alfonso VI of Leon Castile, as well as from King Pedro I of Aragon, but both were heavily occupied by other affairs and weren't able to send any immediate aid. The Cid and his small army were on their own. And so, Rodrigo assembled his forces. Though he was badly outnumbered, he began to look for an opportunity to inflict damage on the Almoravid host. Observing the enemy with his scouts, the Cid noted a vulnerability in what should have been a strength for the Almoravids. The large size of the army, composed of a variety of contingents, could render it unwieldy. Meanwhile, Rodrigo and his men, having fought together for years, could operate tightly and quickly. By early October, the Almoravid host was concentrated outside Valencia on a level plain called Cuarte. For over a week, the Almoravid army made a great show of force outside of Valencia's walls, howling their war cries and launching arrows. Finally, Rodrigo executed a brilliant plan. Dividing his army in two, 
he launched one force in a sortie with such ferocity that the Almoravids concentrated themselves against it. Meanwhile, the Cid led his second force discreetly from one of Valencia's lesser gates and fell upon the enemy camp. Just as Rodrigo had anticipated, the vast Almoravid host was slow to react to this surprise. Rodrigo and his knights spread confusion and terror until the entire Almoravid army was in full rout. The victory was total. El Cid occupied the Almoravid camp, distributing its treasures among his men. The Battle of Cuarta was the first defeat suffered by the Almoravids since their arrival on the Iberian Peninsula. In November of 1096, King Pedro I of Aragon conquered Huesca, freeing him to join El Cid in joint operations against the Almoravids. He and the Cid agreed to combine their armies and reinforce the southern frontier castle of Benicadel in the foothills between Hatiba and Denia. Rodrigo himself had restored this castle in 1091, for it guarded the southern approach to Valencia, making it strategically crucial. As El Cid and King Pedro marched their army southward, they came upon an Almoravid host led by Muhammad ibn Tashfin, nephew to the grim Almoravid commander Yusuf ibn Tashfin. Years earlier, the Cid had defeated Muhammad at the Battle of Cuarta. Outnumbered, the Cid and the king supplied the castle, then quickly swung eastward toward the Mediterranean coast, hoping to strike north back toward Valencian territory. But Muhammad, determined to cut them off, marched his army rapidly to outmaneuver them. When Pedro and the Cid arrived before Byren, they found the Almoravid forces occupying the high ground close to the sea. Almoravid ships had also arrived via their port at Almeria. El Cid and the Aragonese king found their troops pinned between the Berber cavalry on the high ground and the coast from which Almoravid archers were bombarding them with arrows. It was a desperate situation, but the Cid knew well that their only chance was to fight. He rode among his troops, delivering a rousing speech, and ordered them to prepare for battle. Rodrigo's strategy was audacious, but brilliant. The Cid began his attack by leading the Christian knights in a sudden charge straight into the Almoravid center. The move was so bold that it had been totally unexpected. Muhammad watched in stunned silence as this small Christian cavalry burst upon his army. But the Cid's attack was fierce, and to Muhammad's shock, it was his own men who faltered. The Almoravid center broke, and Muhammad's division suffered heavy casualties. By midday, the Almoravids were in full rout, with many survivors leaping into the sea in an attempt to reach their ships, only to drown. The Cid and Pedro had achieved total victory, virtually annihilating Muhammad's army. They returned to Valencia, loaded down with booty, praising God for their triumph. Since they had defeated the King of Castile at the Battle of Sagrajas in 1086, the Almoravids had been the most dangerous enemy of the Christian kingdoms of Spain. Now, once again, El Cid had shown that this enemy was not invincible, and his victory was widely celebrated. Fatefully, one of the knights present at Byren had been King Pedro's younger brother, Alfonso, the future King Alfonso the Battler of Aragon, who would one day conquer Zaragoza. No doubt young Alfonso learned much that day from Spain's most legendary cavalier, Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, El Cid, the Campeador. El Cid would continue to rule in Valencia until at last he died on July 10, 1099 five days before the first crusaders, far away in Palestine, conquered Jerusalem. At his passing, Valencia's future was thrown into doubt, for his only son, Diego, had already died fighting the Moors. Rodrigo's widow, Jimena, was a woman of incredible strength and drive, and continued to reign in place of her husband. But in 1101, the Almoravids besieged Valencia for seven months. Jimena sent an urgent request for aid to King Alfonso VI, when Alfonso advanced on the city, the Almoravids withdrew, but Alfonso concluded that Valencia was too remote from the rest of Christian Spain to be defensible in the long term. Thus, the king evacuated the Christians from the city before setting the whole of it aflame. Jimena traveled back to Castile with Alfonso's army, bearing her husband's body to be buried in the land of his birth. The burning ruins of Valencia were reoccupied and rebuilt by the Almoravids. The city would remain in Moorish hands until it was reconquered by Jaime I of Aragon in 
in the 13th century. El Cid's career is one of the most striking adventures of the medieval era. From loyal servant to the King of Leon Castile, to mercenary captain, to the Emir of Zaragoza, to Prince of Valencia, he showed himself to be one of the most talented military men of his age. His striking victories in the Reconquista made him one of the great legends of medieval poetry and song. El Cid. Today his name is synonymous with Spanish chivalry 